Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Um, my topic tonight is going to be recurrent pregnancy loss. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the causes of recurrent pregnancy loss, um, both researched and some of the treatments that we offer. I'll also go through the diagnostic testing that we offer as well. Um, each topic, I'll tackle all um, points, just so you have an idea of what the diagnosis means, how do we di diagnose it, and how do we treat it. All right, so we'll get started. First of all, we'll start with the definition of recurrent pregnancy loss. Um, the definition is two or more failed clinical pregnancies. So in the past, we used to say three. Clinically, a lot of us won't wait till patients get to three. It's already devastating with mud miscarriage. Waiting till three to do an evaluation can be really hard on a patient. So we usually will say two or more. And a failed clinical pregnancy, clinical pregnancy is defined by an ultrasound or basically pathology diagnosing pregnancy. We include biochemical pregnancies, um, which means a biochemical pregnancy is basically when the pregnancy hormone is in your blood, but we don't quite see anything yet on ultrasound. That also includes your treated pregnancies of unknown location. Sometimes patients will have a pregnancy that we can't determine where it's located. We don't, we're not sure if it's an ectopic or it's a pregnancy in the uterus that we just can't see yet. When we know the levels are not rising appropriately, we still have an idea that that's a potential pregnancy loss. And we can include that in the numbers when it comes to failed pregnancy. Traditionally, ectopic, diagnosed ectopic pregnancies, meaning the pregnancy is in the fallopian tube or elsewhere, or what we call molar pregnancies. And molar pregnancies are not clinical pregnancies. They're basically an overgrowth of pregnancy tissue. We exclude those from the diagnosis of recurrent pregnancy loss. So just to give you a clear understanding, it's two failed clinical pregnancies, and we can sometimes include biochemical pregnancies in that diagnosis. So when you think about pregnancy loss, we have about a 12 to 15% chance of clinical, um, clinically recognized pregnancy loss um, in among patients. Now we, these are clinically recognized, meaning patients will know they're pregnant and know they lost the pregnancy either because they have pathology to confirm or they had an ultrasound to show the pregnancy loss. But they're also gonna be unrecognized pregnancies that are lost. And when you include that with the numbers, the rates are about two to four times higher than traditional 12 to 15% we tell a person who's pregnant. So the true loss rate is probably closer to 30 to 60%. But when someone is currently pregnant and they ask you, what, is my what are my chances that I may have a miscarriage? We usually say about 12 to 15%. That's about an average. Now that does change with maternal age. And we'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later, but as we age females, um, our eggs age with us because we're born with all the eggs we're ever gonna have and they actually age with us. As they age with us, they may not function as well as they used to. And you can see the results in pregnancy outcomes. So you can see the pregnancy loss percentages will actually increase with maternal age. Over age 40, you can see the risk of miscarriage can get up to 50%. And that's just because we more like, we're more likely to have a genetically abnormal embryo at that age. And I'll explain how that works a little bit later. So one of the main questions I wanna tackle early is will it happen again? The risk of a successful pregnancy following someone who's had a history of recurrent pregnancy loss. That's the number one question. Traditionally, we used to say that chance for the successful pregnancy was unlikely, but now with our new data, we can actually say that after even three consecutive losses, patients still have a 60 to 70% chance of a successful pregnancy, even without intervention. So that's what I tell every patient who comes in with current pregnancy loss history. You know, they don't necessarily have infertility. It's the trouble of basically keeping pregnant. And after going through two or three losses, a lot of patients think this is something that they can't overcome. But our research actually shows that after three, even three losses, you can have a successful pregnancy 60, 70% of the time without the interventions I'll go over later. So now we're gonna go through the different causes of recurrent pregnancy loss. We have genetic, anatomic, immunological, endocrine, thrombophilic and environmental. We'll go through all of these and how well they're researched um, and the ones that we focus on in our practice. So we'll start with genetic. Um, 
approximately 50 to 60% of early pregnancy losses are associated with sporadic chromosomal abnormalities. So genetic reasons are the majority of the cause for patients who've had recurrent pregnancy loss. So these are early losses, like usually in the first trimester. As a patient moves along in her pregnancy, the genetic causes become less and less frequent when it comes to a loss. So if someone is in their second trimester and they have a loss, the likelihood of it being genetic drops to 5%. And if they have a live birth, the chance of having a genetic abnormality is 0.5%. So usually the early losses are the ones that are usually caused by genetics. So when we think about genetics, we have, we have them divided into three categories. The first category is the chromosome number. So we get chromosomes from mom and dad. You get a pair. One is from mom, one is from dad. You shouldn't have numbers that veer outside of that in most cases. When you have numbers that are a little off, that's when they can lead to what we call aneuploidy. And these can lead to miscarriage or patients may have um, a late term, or sorry, a term delivery with uh, potential developmental delays. We also have chromosome structure issues. So the chromosomes may be okay in number, but there may be structural rearrangements, meaning they attach to each other in um, non-traditional ways. And I'll show you some examples of that. And then the third category, these are a little bit more less, you know, these are more um, rare, but we'll talk a little bit more about those a little bit later, but single gene disorders and some polygenic disorders, these are inherited um, diseases that can lead to miscarriage, and I'll talk about those at the end. Okay, so we'll start first with aneuploidy. This first little circle, I'm going to use my arrow key, this is what happens right before an egg or sperm divides. You can see there are two lines representing each chromosome, one from mom, one from dad. In order to reproduce, you obviously have to split into two eggs or two sperm in order to allow them to combine with sperm or an egg. So just to give you an idea, if this was an egg, it would have to give up half of its DNA in order to make room for the sperm DNA that's coming. Now, as the egg divides, it should split evenly in half. But as you can see in the circle below it, you see how they've all split, one on each side. But the one towards the bottom, the third from the bottom, you can see how two of the chromosomes went to one side. So that egg that results from that split is gonna have an extra chromosome and the other egg is gonna be missing the chromosome it needs. The karyotype on the right, which shows what a normal karyotype looks like. If you look at where the arrow is pointing, it's pointing at chromosome 21. Instead of having two chromosomes, there are three. That actually causes a syndrome called Down syndrome. With the extra chromosome 21, yes, it can lead to live birth, but they usually do lead to miscarriage. So when a woman has a split of the egg that occurs that's irregular, sometimes it'll lead to this irregular, this basically karyotype that can lead to miscarriage. The older a woman gets, the more likely these aberrations and splits happen. The structural rearrangement option, this is um, another cause for recurrent pregnancy loss. So you may have a couple who are having recurrent pregnancy loss and they don't necessarily know why. When you actually look at their karyotypes, so the male or the female in the couple, we actually look at their karyotypes. Sometimes we'll see that they have all their DNA that they need, but for some reason, some of their chromosomes seem to be um, attached at different locations. So if you look at chromosome number 14, there's only one chromosome there when there should be two. If you look next to it at chromosome 13, 14 is attached to 13. So this individual has everything he or she needs, sorry, she, it's a she, everything she needs to be a normal functioning individual. But when she splits her DNA in half, you can see how half of her eggs may end up having extra an extra chromosome, um, and you can see how the other half may be missing chromosome 14, okay? So these splits can lead to irregularities that will be passed on to conception, um, and that can lead to miscarriages in patients as well. So these structural rearrangements are something someone is born with. We can actually test our patients by doing, we do a karyotype on the male and female to actually confirm if they have some kind of rearrangement that can lead to this. 
The one I talked about previously is something that happens with females as we age. So there are two different um, causes for these two different rearrangements. But genetics, like I said, is a really big cause of miscarriage, especially recurrent pregnancy loss among this patient population. Okay. Give me one second, sorry. All right, and this is the single gene disorder that I mentioned earlier. So single gene disorders include things like cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, alpha thalassemia. Alpha thalassemia is a good example. If you have a couple who are carriers for alpha thalassemia, sometimes they, when they have a baby, their deficiency can lead to a baby that's missing the chromosomes, the healthy genes that they need to make a certain protein. And by missing that protein, it can lead to miscarriage. So there are a lot of what we call single gene disorders that can cause miscarriage because of the proteins that result from the DNA. And I won't go into too much detail, but we do offer our patients the chance to do what we call genetic carrier screening to see if you're a carrier for any of these diseases that can lead to poor pregnancy outcomes. If being a carrier doesn't mean that you are sick or, or will have an issue with the disease, we just worry about you passing it on, especially if your partner is also a carrier. So when we offer our routine genetic carrier screening, that's the purpose. We're actually seeing if you're a carrier for any similar um, disorders. And if you are, we'll test your partner. If you're both carriers, we do have the option of doing IVF where we can genetically test the embryos to see which embryos are healthy and which are actually gonna be sick with the disease. All right, and those are all the genetic reasons. We'll move on to anatomic. When we diagnose uterine anomalies, which is our focus when it comes to miscarriage, there are a couple of modalities that we have. We have ultrasound, which is the first one here. And with ultrasound, we even have 3D ultrasound options to give us a really good view of the uterine, the uterus and the uterine cavity. We also have MRI of the pelvis, also a good way to look at a 3D view of the uterus. Saline infusion sonogram is an ultrasound as well, but instead of just doing the ultrasound, you put fluid in the cavity to basically help look inside the cavity to see if there's anything structural that would hurt um, or basically put a patient at risk for a recurrent pregnancy loss. The next one is hysterosalpingogram, which some patients I've heard refer to as the dye test. That's a test where we actually put fluid that you can see on x-ray and we actually see if your tubes are open. Um, and it can be a way of looking at the uterine cavity for any basically abnormalities that can lead to pregnancy loss. The last two options are actually procedures that require anesthesia um, in most cases. Hysteroscopy, if you've heard of a colonoscopy, a hysteroscopy is a camera that looks in the uterus um, to basically see if there's anything like any structural issues that can lead to pregnancy. And the laparoscopy is looking through your belly button at the structures on the outside of the uterus to see if there's anything outside that's affecting pregnancy. I'm gonna show you some picture examples of all of these. The first one is the MRI. This is a traditional MRI, this is what we call a normal one. This patient has a normal looking uterus and normal bladder. I know it's hard to tell, but this is the uterus right here. This is the bladder. This would be her stomach and this would be her back. So it's almost like she's cut in half. You can almost see her pelvic, her tailbone right here. And this is her spine. This is a normal uterus right here. The baby would grow in this little area that's labeled E. C is cervix. M is myometrium, so that's the muscle around the uterus. So this is what I would call a normal MRI. This is a saline infusion sonogram that I mentioned earlier. When you do an ultrasound, this is the uterus here. Normally the walls of the uterus, which is right here, they touch each other and we can't really see inside. When you do the saline infusion sonogram, we put fluid inside to actually help us distend and look inside. This is what we would consider normal. It's smooth all the way around. The uterus is normal on the inside. If you see something inside, you'll see like a big bulge representing a fibroid, or you may see something like a polyp floating in there or even bands of scar tissue going across but this is what we would consider normal. This can be done in the office, no anesthesia required. This is a hysterosalpingogram, the dye test or HSG, test where we basically put fluid into the uterine cavity and it basically checks to see if the tubes are gonna spill and be open. You can see with this one on the side here, her tubes are open, same with this patient here. The uterine cavity uh, looks like a nice triangle. The disadvantage of the hysterosalpingogram is that you can't really see inside. 
you can get an idea of the out of the shape on the of the of the cavity on the outside, but you're not really getting a clear definition of what's happening inside because the dye covers everything. This is the hysteroscopy, what we consider the gold standard. Hysteroscopy, like colonoscopy, is a scope. Tiny camera, it's smaller than a pen, looks inside the uterus. As you can see here, these are two different women, but these are both considered normal intrauterine cavities. So nothing here structurally um, that would lead to recurrent pregnancy loss um, structurally looking at these, uh, this um, hysteroscopy. This is a laparoscopy. So you can see this is looking from her belly button towards her feet. This is the top of the uterus. This is her fallopian tube, which looks nice and normal. This is an ovary on this side, ovary on this side, and this is a fallopian tube. So sometimes a laparoscopy can, can be helpful with diagnosing uterine anomalies. Um, and uh, for patients who are getting a laparoscopy for other reasons, sometimes you can just look to see if everything is okay down in the pelvic region. Now we'll go into a little bit more detail about what are the anatomic causes that can lead to recurrent pregnancy loss. The first one is congenital. So these are birth defects of the uterus. The second one is uterine fibroids. And the third one, intrauterine adhesion. So basically scar tissue inside the uterine cavity. Birth defects of the uterus are not very common, but they are common, more common amongst the patients with recurrent pregnancy loss. Here are just some examples. The first picture here is what we consider a normal uterus. A, this one right here, or sorry, B is a double uterus. So it's a didelphus uterus. We call it didelphus rep as representation of two um, uterus. So you can see it's split into two. When we're born, our uterus forms from two tubes that come together and they usually fuse together to make a normal cavity. When they don't fuse together, they lead to two separate cavities. And you can see they're sometimes a little bit smaller than the normal size cavity and they can make it have, like, patients can have obstetrical outcomes that are not ideal. C is also um, another didelphus uterus. The difference between these two patients is that one has a double vagina and one has a single, but the uterine cavity is very similar. The next row of um, uterine anomalies are called bicorneate. Bicorneate, you can see it almost fused together, but not quite. This, this bicornuate here, you can see this half didn't develop as well as this half. So sometimes when patients present with these uterine anomalies, we have to counsel them on the importance of singleton pregnancies. You know, these are not the patients you want to have twins or put them at risk for multiples. Most of my patients with um, bicornuate uterus you know, do very well in pregnancy. These are not repairable, these two options. You know, we just have to focus on close monitoring of these patients, singleton pregnancies, of course. They, we need to you know, make sure that their pregnancies are growing appropriately. Sometimes there can be fetal growth restriction with some of these um, uterine anomalies. The next row I'm gonna show you next is the um, uterine septum. So the uterine septum, just like a nasal septum, it's a wall down the middle of the uterus. So you can see here, this is a, it almost looks like a normal uterus. It's just a little wall down the middle. These are actually repairable. So with a hysteroscopy, you can actually take scissors and cut this out and it will look just like the normal cavity. The septate uterus is the only um, repairable uterine anomaly um, that we, rec the only one that we recommend repairing. And then you have unicornuate. This just means that only one side developed. Instead of the two tubes coming together, only one side developed. Sometimes this can be associated with kidney abnormalities. Some patients may notice they may have a missing kidney in addition, and that's really just genetics. Sometimes the, 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 kid, the kidney and the, um, the kidney development and the pelvic organ development are linked. So sometimes when you're missing one or the other, it can be, it can be a sign that you're having an abnormality in the other. All right, so here you can see the distribution of how these anomalies happen. Septate is the most common, which is good because it is the one that's repairable. Then followed by bicornuate. Arcuate is basically like a septum. It's just a heart-shaped uterus. So it's basically what I would call a mild septum uterus. These are not necessarily needed to be, these don't necessarily need to be repaired. Then you have unicornuate uterus, the one with only one side development, and the divelphus is the least common. Incidence. Among the fertile and infertile women, these defects are three to four percent. So if you have a history of infertility, malarian or uterine abnormalities are not necessarily more common. When you have recurrent pregnancy loss, though, you can see the success rate, or sorry, the incidence rate actually goes up to five to ten percent. And the women who have late miscarriages or preterm deliveries, it goes over 25 percent. So not necessarily linked with infertility, but we do see it more amongst our patients who have recurrent pregnancy loss. 
So this is just some pic. I just really used this slide to show how a septate uterus is taken care of hysteroscopically. So you can see here, there is a little tiny pair of scissors that are basically cutting right where the septum is. That's our view with the hysteroscope. We're looking and we're seeing um, the septum divide as we're doing our cutting. Patients who have um, septums can usually consider pregnancy within a few months. It's not something that they were, basically they would require a long recovery, which is good. Bear with me. Bear with me, sorry. All right, uterine factor. The next one is uterine fibroids. So fibroids, can be located at any part of the uterus. Why do we care? Fibroids inside the uterus, as you can see here, there's a intracavitary fibroid. Those can actually lead to miscarriage because they're taking up space for where the baby should be growing. Whenever we see what we call intracavitary or submucosal fibroid, we recommend removing them. Intramural, the ones in the wall or the ones on the outside are more controversial. For those ones, if patients are not symptomatic and they're not especially large, we don't always have to remove them. The ones we do recommend removing are definitely the ones inside where the baby should be growing because um, we do know they can be associated with loss. We can take care of uterine fibroids with a hysteroscopy as well. And in some cases we do have to do it laparoscopically or uh, like a middle mini bikini cut incision like a C-section scar basically, and it's called an abdominal myomectomy. But thanks to a lot of minimally invasive surgeons here in Houston, we're able to do this laparoscopy, uh, we'll do the laparoscopy and patients are, can go home the same day. This is an example of what scar tissue looks like inside the uterine cavity. These are hysteroscopic views. So you can see how these bands of tissue span the cavity. You shouldn't see these bands. I've shown you guys a picture of what a normal cavity looks like. This is what scar tissue looks like. We can actually take scissors and cut these, cut these as well. When it's really severe, sometimes these scar, the scarring, is, it's called Asherman syndrome. And the cause of scar tissue inside the uterus is from prior pregnancy or prior surgery in the uterine cavity. Patients are at most risk for obtaining scar tissue after a pregnancy. So some women after having a baby may end up getting a DNC because their placenta is stuck or they have heavy bleeding and they can be at risk for scar tissue or patients with recurrent pregnancy loss can be at risk for scar tissue. And it's unfortunate because the scar tissue also puts them at risk for another loss. When we treat scar tissue, we basically do a hysteroscopic surgical resection with the scissors, like what we do with the septum. And in some cases, um, we actually give patients hormones afterwards to help it heal. So by giving hormones like estrogen followed by progesterone, we're letting those areas that we cut keep from sticking back together and leading to the scar tissue to develop again. Um, when the scar tissue is especially bad, some patients may actually use an intraoperative balloon um, and they keep it in for five days to keep those areas from sticking back together. So it's like a little tiny balloon that sits in the uterus and it's rubber. It's not anything, you know, un too uncomfortable, but it's basically keeping the walls of the uterus open and letting it heal. And it usually stays for five days. When I was a fellow at Columbia, we would stay it, keep it for about five days and then patients would come take it out the next week. Um, but we usually reserve the balloons for very severe cases of scar tissue. All right, now we'll move on to the next cause of recurrent pregnancy loss, and these are the immunological causes. Now, there's a disorder called antiphospholipid syndrome, and we'll see this in 5 to 15% of, of recurrent pregnancy loss patients, and it's an acquired autoimmune condition that can, where pregnancy loss is actually one of the criteria, one of the diagnostic criteria. So when you look at the clinical diagnosis for antiphospholipid syndrome, these are the listed things we look for. So blood clotting is one thing, but when it comes to the pregnancy of such outcomes, we look at three options. The first one is one or more unexplained fetal death after 10 weeks. So that's a first trimester loss after 10 weeks. One or more losses, basically patients who have preeclampsia or placental issues before 34 weeks. And the last one is three or more unexplained consecutive pregnancy losses in less than 10 weeks of pregnancy. So you can see where the recurrent pregnancy loss patients fit in. When the patients have that kind of history, we can actually do blood tests. And these are the laboratory tests that we would recommend for a patient who's had, who's had recurrent pregnancy loss. 
lupus anticoagulant, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but these are the, the, the tests that we would do for a patient with what we suspect is antiphospholipid syndrome. When we have this test become positive, these are the patients that will need to be on baby aspirin and heparin with their pregnancies, and it can actually help their outcomes with their next spontaneous pregnancy. All right, so then we move on to endocrine causes of recurrent pregnancy loss. Endocrine causes make up 15 to 60% of recurrent pregnancy loss patients. And I've listed them all here and I'll talk briefly about each. Thyroid disease, poorly controlled thyroid disease, whether it's hyperfunctioning or underfunctioning thyroid and the presence of thyroid antibodies can be linked to recurrent pregnancy loss. Um, we will be very strict when it comes to thyroid in our patients, um, whether they are recurrent pregnancy loss or not. But with patients who have a history of hypothyroidism and recurrent pregnancy loss, we're very strict with looking at the TSH levels and the supplementation of their thyroid. When they become pregnant, I always tell my thyroid patients, remember your thyroid is so important, not just to keep you pregnant the first trimester, but it's also important in the second and third trimester. These are patients that who are on thyroid medicine, once they get pregnant, sometimes we need to increase it by 30% automatically just to make sure they're well controlled. So I always stress that to my thyroid patients because I want them to remember as well. So when they go to the OB, they always keep their thyroid in mind. Diabetes, that's another cause, endocrine cause of recurrent pregnancy loss, but we usually will see it with patients who are very poorly controlled. So that's a hemoglobin A1C of over eight, which is very high. Um, not only does it lead to miscarriage, but patients can have birth defects of their babies as a result of having a poorly controlled um, diabetes. Our goal is to get that hemoglobin A1C less than 6.5, 6.6, and that's still kind of high, but that's, that's where it needs to be if they're starting off that high. And then patients with PCOS, um, and these patients may notice they may be at higher risk as well. The miscarriage rate for PCOS patients may be 20 to 40% versus that 12 to 15% that I told you at the beginning of my presentation. PCOS patients may have a slightly higher chance of miscarriage. We really don't know why. Um, there have been some theories. They always have a high LH because they're not ovulating regularly. Um, they have high testosterone levels, um, what we call the male androgens. And then IR means insulin resistance. So that goes back to the diabetes that we talked about earlier. So PCOS patients, we don't really know the mechanism, but some of the research is showing that they may have a slightly increased risk. The next endocrine um, abnormality is hyperprolactinemia. So prolactin is the hormone that comes from your brain and it usually is high when you're pregnant, but it also helps make milk when you're breastfeeding. In early pregnancy, we don't want very high prolactin. Um, we actually have studies that show that treatment in early pregnancy for patients who ha have high prolactin has shown to benefit um, patients and lower their risk of miscarriage. And then the last topic is luteal phase defect. This is very controversial. Um, we don't have very great studies supporting it in recurrent pregnancy loss, but I think most fertility doctors in this country with a patient with recurrent pregnancy loss, how do we treat theoretical um, luteal phase defect, we do progesterone su uh, supplementation. So it's controversial, but we still do it. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about, about some of our treatment options and why we do it at the end. All right, we'll move on to thrombophilic. So this theory, when it comes to thrombophilia, we, we actually think that thrombophilia basically means blood clotting. When you have your baby implant in the uterus, the placenta is how the mom delivers basically nutrients to the baby. When you're making blood clots very easily, we worry about blood flow to the baby and the potential of having a pregnancy loss because of that. So there can be some inherited risk for blood clots. So we actually will talk to our patients who have a family history of a blood clot or have a personal history of a blood clot and recurrent pregnancy loss um, and have them consider doing genetic testing to see if they're at risk for clotting. What does that mean? It doesn't really change much. We would do the same thing that we did with the antiphospholipid syndrome. We actually would start them on baby aspirin and heparin to um, basically help with the blood flow to the pregnancy um, uh, in these situations where we worry about blood clotting causing that risk of loss. All right, and then the last topic I'll talk about is environmental. So these are the lifestyle factors. These are not well studied, of course. Environmental factors that lead to miscarriage lead to more of the sporadic miscarriages versus recurrent pregnancy loss. But we do bring it up with our patients because you know no one wants to have a loss, much less three. But these are lifestyle factors that patients can control that can really make a difference with their outcomes. 
Cigarette smoking, of course, obesity has definitely been shown to be associated with increased risk of recurrent pregnancy loss and in patients who conceive naturally. So it's very important uh, that we talk to our patients before pregnancy meet about weight control because it can really um, affect potential outcomes. Lifestyle habits associated with miscarriage, of course, recreational drug use. We talk to patients about alcohol consumption and limiting that and even caffeine intake. Um, so trying to limit your caffeine intake would be very helpful as well. After discussing obviously all of these factors that play a role with recurrent pregnancy loss, I always have to stress with my patients, 50% of patients will not have a diagnosis. We would do all these tests and we may not come up with an answer. So what does that mean? I, I tell my patients, you know, even if I don't come up with an answer on why you're having recurrent pregnancy loss, we have a solution. We have enough good studies to tell patients that whether we find an answer or not, there are enough studies to show that supportive care, meaning that ultrasounds, frequent visits with the fertility doctor, um, weekly visits, blood checks, progesterone suppositories, just support of these patients, give them a better outcome. So, you know, when a patient comes to see us for recurrent pregnancy loss and I don't have a, a diagnosis of why they're having their loss, I'll definitely go over the option of supportive care. So, you know, we don't have an answer. You don't have infertility, but next time you're pregnant and you have a positive test, come to us right away. We will start what we call that supportive care. We will do the supportive care till you're at least ready to move into your second trimester, and then we'll transition you to your OBGYN where the chance and the risk of miscarriage is very, is gonna be low at that point. A lot of OBs are gonna be able to do the same thing, but some may not be able to. Your fertility doctor, we're equipped to do that supportive care, that weekly ultrasound, the blood test, the monitoring, and that for a lot of patients that relieves a lot of stress, which can help their outcomes as well. So definitely if you have a history of recurrent pregnancy loss, seeing a fertility doctor is not a bad thing. We are actually here to help come up with the diagnosis. And if we don't, we have an option for supportive care to help make sure your next pregnancy is successful.